Um, Dr. Love Essichili is a chemical engineer and passionate um, environmentalist. Mm -hmm. She will be talking Bilanced. about new kinds of bioplastics. Bio there have been You've many of them that have been developed to tackle email with, you know, the myriad problems we have with you might have. conventional plastics. But a lot of these um, new secondly, bioplastics aren't um, all they're the next up month's to be. lecture in September. Uh, she will explore um, the major we'll types of sustainable plastics can sustainable plastics save us? Outline both their so strengths and weaknesses. Um, and then highlight what we as consumers and taxpayers can do to help create a chemical engineer economy for the environmentalist ballot. She will be talking about new kinds of to come along. There have been many of them that have been developed. Um, and then just a full quick with, you know, detail. Um, um, problems we have other upcoming have events conventional that you might be interested in. But a lot of these um, on Thursday the 13th of September, um, the we will be having a panel discussion. Uh, she will explore um, about the critically endangered plastics and sustainable plastics. October's lecture, we will be looking into sea star wasting disease in the sea. So after the economy, most of the lectures are then designed to feedback for you. Somebody in one of the forms suggested many of them are wasting them. And then just a quick so, um, so, so hopefully it should be very interesting in the event. And then um, we will have our daughter Elisa um, Kirti from the other UBC. She's going to be talking about how to have to take the state of 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 the like <laughs> and <laughs> The local shorelines. So with that, so welcome Alana. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth, and thank you to all of you for coming today. It's nice to see some familiar faces, but a lot of new faces as well. Um, as Ruth mentioned, I do work at OceanWise, but I'll be talking tonight about my master's research at Simon Fraser University. Now, if you came to this lecture, you may already know that we're facing massive species declines globally. If you look at the red bars on this graph, they signify species that are at risk of extinction. Across all these groups, that's about an average of 24% of all species are faced with extinction. This is what scientists are calling the sixth mass extinction. Now the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and the Convention of Biological Diversity, recognize the need for ex situ conservation. And that's because field conservation is really not enough to save a lot of these species. Ex situ conservation are management strategies under which individuals are maintained in a controlled or modified environment. So this could include captive breeding, translocation, or reintroduction, or head starting. Head starting is when you raise young or juvenile animals in captivity, pass their vulnerable stage, and then you release them into the wild. So for instance, in frogs, that would be keeping them in captivity as tadpoles until they undergo metamorphosis, and then you would release them as frogs to the wild. And then at this point, they'd hopefully have a better chance of survival. Now, ex situ conservation is beneficial for many reasons. It can help bolster wild populations or increase the genetics of a wild population, or it can help just buy time while you're doing field conservation. Now, ex situ conservation or captive conservation has been absent from a lot of classic conservation organizations. So a lot of these efforts have been spearheaded by zoos. <coughs> 
animals began captive breeding animal or zoos began captive breeding animals with the rationale that animals kept and bred in zoos serve as an insurance measure against extinction in the wild. Zoos have been breeding animals for many years. This isn't something that's new. But breeding animals specifically for conservation is now at the forefront of their efforts. And the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or WAZA for short, has publicly committed to align its strategic goals to improve the status of biodiversity by safeguarding ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity. And to date, zoos have been involved in some successful reintroductions. So here are three examples of Canadian species. All three of these species had very few individuals remaining in the wild. And it was deemed that if no human intervention was done, they'd each have been faced with extinction. Now, thankfully, due to the efforts of Canadian zoos, they've been all part of captive breeding and reintroduction programs. And all three of these species have seen improvements in their population numbers in the wild. Importantly, the swift fox has actually been downlisted from extinct in the wild to threatened, thanks to reintroduction efforts. Of course, not all species that are kept in a zoo are bred for conservation purposes. It's no secret that zoos cater to their visitors, and people like cuddly, cute, or colorful animals. So what is the conservation value of animals in zoos? And this is the question that really sparked my interest about four years ago. At the time, I was working at the Toronto Zoo as a public programs leader. And I decided to move to Vancouver and start a master's degree investigating the role of zoos in conservation. When I was about one year into my master's research, a program called Renew Zoo launched. Renew Zoo is a graduate training program, and it trains graduate students to work in a zoo or, con zoo or aquarium field, specifically in conservation. Again, in the, about the first year of my master's, I traveled to Whitehorse in Yukon to present at Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums to give a presentation about the type of research that a student can embark on in this program and tell them why it's so important from the student perspective and a future conservation research perspe perspective. Fast forward two years, and this is a group of us at the Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums meeting last fall in Ottawa. And these are students, professors, and researchers and zoo staff that are all involved in the Renew Zoo program. These students are from six student different universities across Canada. So this is a program that's led by Laurentian University in Sudbury on Ontario, but it also involves five other universities across the country, as well as many partners with zoos and aquariums and um, other research associations. And the students that you see here in this photo are looking at the role that zoos play in conservation from all different angles, from philosophical considerations to behavioral ecology to captive breeding efforts. And this is because this is such a broad question. And because of this, I, for my research, decided to focus on one taxa in particular. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this talk. Amphibians are one of the most imperiled class of vertebrates. So frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians are facing levels of extinction that are higher than any other class of vertebrates. So if you look at that red dotted line, you can see that approximately one third of amphibian species are at risk of extinction, which is higher than any other group. Those bars that are in that light pink, if you can see, I recognize that it's kind of hard to see on this screen, but those, those uh, signify species that are data deficient. And what that means is that there's just not enough information known about them to be able to make that call on what their threat status is. And that's the case for a lot of frog species, even more so for species of sharks. Now, these conservation assessments are done by the IUCN, or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they make this based on a lot of different factors, based on the geographical range of the species, or the number, or their population in the wild. Now, unfortunately, the numbers are not much better for Canadian amphibians and reptiles. A new report by WWF Canada reported that Canadian amphibian and reptiles have lost 34% of their populations on average. And this decline is due to a variety of factors, from habitat loss to climate change to infectious disease. Chytridiomycosis is an infectious fungal disease that has plagued frog populations in many parts of the world. It's spread in part due to the pet trade, 
And when a frog is infected, what will happen is that it will affect their skin, and then it will affect their ability to release toxins, to absorb nutrients, and even to breathe. And chytridiomycosis in particular has proved very hard to treat in the wild. Therefore, in 2007, an amphibian arc was formed. This is an ex situ or captive focused conservation organization that helps advise and coordinate global captive conservation efforts. It does this in many traditional institutions, such as the Vancouver Aquarium, but also in smaller specialized breeding centers, such as this one in Panama that I have pictured here. And their focus is on species that are hardest to safeguard in the wild. A good example of this is the Chianzi spray toad. The Chianzi spray toad is an amphibian that lives or lived in the Chianzi Gorge in Tanzania. It lived specifically in the mist off of this waterfall. So when a hydroelectric dam was installed, this mist dried up and it lost its only remaining habitat. Now thankfully, scientists saw this coming and in 2000, a team from the Bronx and Toledo Zoo went in and captured 500 toads from the wild. They started a captive breeding program and since then, in 2012, 2,000 toads were released to the wild following the rehabilitation of their natural habitat. To give you an example that's close to home, this is the Oregon spotted frog. It lives in BC's Fraser Valley, and its numbers have declined almost 90% due to habitat loss, invasive species, and disease. This is a species that's bred here at the Vancouver Aquarium, also the Vancouver Zoo. The Vancouver Aquarium joined the recovery team in 2000, and since then, it has released tadpoles, or toads to the wild, for nine consecutive years. So since starting in 2000, it's raised over 20,000 uh, tadpoles to be released to the wild. And this is one of the most endangered amphibians in Canada, so these efforts are ongoing. The number of amphibian species in zoos and captive breeding, such as this one, are increasing. Holdings have nearly doubled since 1994, and the number of amphibians and captive breeding programs has increased by 57% since 2007. But what we don't know is whether the, species, whether the species are the ones that need it the most, or are they the ones with the highest conservation need, or are zoos just selecting species based on their display value or for other reasons? Are zoos holding imperiled amphibians? Now, fortunately, zoos keep track of what they keep. So using ZIMS, which is the Zoological Information Management System, we were able to tally 532 amphibian species in 516 institutions globally. Now this includes zoos, also aquariums, and non-traditional institutions, such as small specialized captive breeding centers, often located in high biodiversity areas in the tropics. Zoos keep records for the species they keep for several reasons. For one, it's important to be accredited, so to be accredited by the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums or your regional zoo accreditation body, you have to keep records on the species you keep. And that's important to know the genetic viability of your populations in your zoo, but it also really helps when it comes to trading individuals with other zoos, which is really commonly done for animal management. An example of one of these non-traditional uh, institutions in this data set is this convent in Mexico. The sisters of the Monastery of Dominican Order have been breeding this endangered salamander for 150 years. Ambistoma dumarelli, or Echoques, more commonly known, is an imperiled salamander that lives only in one lake in Mexico. The nuns that live close by to this lake have been breeding this salamander for 150 years to make cough syrup. So this cough syrup is thought to cure anemia, coughs, and asthma. Now, the nuns are continue to breed the salamander, not only to keep up this tradition, but to save the species. There are fewer than 100 anchoques in the wild, and that's due to over, over hunting, um, as well as habitat destruction and invasive species. When Sister Ophelia was asked about their work, she said that it's about protecting a species from nature. If we don't work to, to take care of it, to protect it, it will disappear from creation. Now, the reason why I have these beautiful photos and this backstory is because there was a journalist named Joffrey Giller, and he happened to read our study and looked at our data set and saw that there was this nunnery in Mexico, and he was really interested in it. 
So he contacted us and he asked us if we had any more information, and at the time, I didn't at all. And he wrote a grant, and he got it, he went down to Mexico, and he covered the full story. So if you are interested in reading more about the work that they're doing, it's, the story is now covered in National Geographic, as well as the New York Times. Now, back to amphibians in zoos. So once we had this list of all these species that are in a zoo, we next need to determine that if, if they are the ones with the highest conservation need. And we did this by pairing them up with their closest relatives not in a zoo. So here we have two species of, oh, all good. We have <laughs> two species of <laughs> rain frogs. Um, the one on the right is in a zoo, whereas the one on the left is not. So these are sister, what you call sister species. So that means that they are the closest relatives you can get. So if zoos are prioritizing threatened species, then this one on the right should be at greater extinction risk than its sister species on the left. So to, to determine this, we scored species for traits related to their conservation need. First, we looked at their IUCN red list status. So that's their, the best indicator we have for current threat. That graph I showed you at the beginning, that's using data from the IUCN. We then looked at range size, because species that have a really large range size are at decreased extinction risk than species that have a small range size. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. So if you have a natural disaster come through or disease, the more geographical range you cover, the better your chances are of surviving. Same thing goes for habitat breadth. We looked at habitat breadth as a degree of specialization. So species that can live in several different habitats are going to be better off than species that are confined or specialized to one specific habitat. And we found that amphibians and zoos were equally threatened as their close relatives in the wild if you looked at their current IUCN threat status. So that's their red list data. So both of these amphibians are critically endangered. However, the species in a zoo has a three and a half times larger geographic range size and a 27% broader habitat breadth than its close relative in the wild. If we go back to our example, you can see that our rain frog um, in a zoo is critically endangered, as well as its sister species in the wild, but it has a geographic range of 500 kilometers squared versus 12, and it can live in tropical montane and lowland forest whereas its close relative in the wild can only live in tropical montane forest. Now this isn't necessarily good news because this means that the species in a zoo is at lower future risk of extinction than its close relative in the wild. But of course, zoos house species for many reasons aside from threat. So they could house them for their educational value or for research. So just because a frog is in a zoo doesn't mean that it's being bred for conservation reasons. So I redid the same analysis, but for only for species involved in conservation breeding programs. So these are species like the Oregon spotted frog that are bred specifically to bolster their population in the wild. We scored them for the exact same traits related to extinction risk. And I found that when you only looked at species in conservation breeding programs, they were more threatened than their close relatives in the wild. So I've given you another example here. We have the mountain yellow-legged frog and the cascades frog. These are very close relatives. But the mountain-legged frog is in a captive breeding program, whereas the cascade frog is not. And the mountain yellow-legged frog is endangered, whereas its close relative is only near threatened. So importantly, species in conservation breeding programs were not the wide-ranging habitat generalists found in zoos. So if you look here, this example, the range size is actually smaller for the one in the captive breeding program, but on average, there was no difference. And also, it could inhabit six different habitats, whereas its close relative can inhabit seven. So very similar, we found very similar results for range size and for habitat breadth. And we found that species in conservation breeding programs were more threatened when it came to current threat. So to recap this section, if we expect zoos or species in zoos and breeding programs to be the ones with the greatest conservation need, then we'd expect to see increased IUCN threat levels smaller ranges, and narrower habitat breadths. What we found for all zoo holdings was that they had approximately the same IUCN threat status, but they had larger geographic range sizes and broader habitat breadths.
Now, fortunately, conservation breeding programs are helping to bolster the representation of threatened species in captive collections. However, if zoos are to maximize their role in species conservation, then they should be explicitly considering threat when choosing species for future collections. Now, this puts zoos in this role. This is a really difficult task, and there's no easy answer to how to select species for collections. And there's a lot of different things that you have to consider. For one, amenability to captivity. So not every species that you're going to bring in is going to be able to breed successfully in a zoo. Here I'm showing you data from Amphibian Arc. That's that captive conservation organization I've been mentioning. And here I've shown the proportion of programs that achieved breeding success. So here you can see that only about 50% of the species that are in captive breeding programs are reproducing in captivity. And only about one-fifth of these species are reproducing to the second generation. So this means that you don't want to waste your resources bringing in species that are not going to do well in captivity. So that's definitely something that you need to consider for future collections. You also have to consider the probability of reintroduction success. So it's one thing to have a species in a zoo and raise it successfully in a zoo and breed it, but it's another thing uh, to reintroduce it to the wild. So for instance, if a frog was faced with disease risk in the wild, so chytridiomycosis, reintroducing those frogs right away would do very little for their survival because they would just get reinfected with the disease. So these are definitely considerations that you have to make when you're prioritizing species for a conservation breeding program, if your goal is to reintroduce them to the wild. You might also consider research. Conservation research is actually the number one most cited reason for holding a species in captivity. This could be research on species biology. It could also be research on how to best breed frogs in captivity. That could be applied to breeding it for a future conservation breeding program or for breeding a close relative that's threatened with extinction in the wild. Animals also have educational value in zoos. So zoos do a really good job at helping people connect to local wildlife and making that personal connection from the animals to their visitors. Now with over 700 million visitors to zoos each year, this is a huge potential for zoos to make a positive impact. And zoos do a really good job at this. So this is a picture from the Yukon Wildlife Reserve in Whitehorse, taken during one of their educational programs. And this just goes to show how zoos can be, do a really good job at connecting people to species that live in their local environment. The Yukon Wildlife Reserve is actually pretty unique because all of the species that they house in their facility live in the Yukon. So they're all native species. And then in that way, their visitors have that connection to species that they share the land with. The Vancouver Aquarium also has educational programs that do something similar. So many of their educational programs bring kids and children or families out to Stanley Park shoreline where they can discover aquatic invertebrates or other marine life. And hopefully that this, by making this connection to their local environment, it's inspiring them to take action. And one way that we allow them to take action here at the Vancouver Aquarium is through the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, which is the program that I work for now. This is a direct action conservation partnership of OceanWise and WWF Canada, and we support a network of volunteers that lead cleanups across the country. Every year we support around 2,000 cleanups and approximately 60,000 volunteers. And this program has been running for 25 years now. Zoos and aquariums are the third largest financial supporter of field conservation behind WWF and the Nature Conservancy. So if we look at numbers from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which is the North American Zoo Association, they spend approximately $220 million US on field conservation um, in 2017. If we look at these numbers globally, that number is around $350 million. So this is a huge contribution to field conservation efforts. And it's not only financial support that they offer. Zoos can also help with administrative work, providing animals, as well as technical expertise, such as veterinary expertise. There's a lot of veterinary expertise that's required for a lot of these programs, such as like transporting animals or vaccines. To give you a local example, this is J50, or Scarlet, 
So this is a three and a half year old southern um, resident killer whale. Now she's lost, she's very underweight and she's appearing lethargic. So on August 9th, Vancouver Aquarium's head vet, Dr. Martin Helena, shot Scarlett with a dose of antibiotics using a dart. And they're hoping that this will improve her situation. So right now they're still working on a diagnosis and will likely be administering a second dose of antibiotics. But this is just an example of zoos and technical expertise at zoos having a positive impact on field conservation efforts. And the point I'm trying to make here with that last example is that management is needed more and more to maintain species in the wild. And this distinction between what's captive and field conservation is becoming increasingly blurred. Zoos have the technical expertise and the resources to positively impact um, conservation, and they should be encouraged to do so. If we're going to meet ambitious global conservation targets, then we're going to need their help. I'll just end by thanking some of the individuals um, that really helped me on these projects, such as my collaborators, um, people that provided feedback for me, as well as my funders. And on that note, if you are thinking about pursuing a graduate degree and you're interested in the role that zoos play in conservation, please come free to come chat with me and I can give you more information on the Renew Zoo program. Thank you. So I have a microphone here um, for people, anybody who wishes to ask Alana any questions. Um, is there any questions in the audience? <laughs> Do you know when, like what year, the species started to decline? It's really hard to say um, which year amphibians started to decline. I think it was started to become noticed in the mid-80s. But amphibians in general have been a very data deficient group. So it's hard to get that to know exactly just because we knew very little about amphibians for such a long time and still baseline data for a lot of species is missing. Any more questions? I was going to ask a question, if I remember the talk from when you gave it to me before. Um, well, just first of all, Link, what inspired you to get into studying amphibians um, in particular? Like, what, how were your experiences at Toronto Zoo, and how did that influence your choices of um, pursuing graduate studies? Mm -hmm. Well, I was interested in the role that zoos play in conservation um, from more of a broad uh, standpoint, looking at all taxa. But the reason why I narrowed it on amphibians is because they're generally considered really suitable for captive conservation. So they're small, they don't cost a lot of money or take up a lot of space, and they don't have you know, learned behaviors. So for all those logistical reasons, they seemed like a good candidate. Also, a lot of the colorful, um, species, colorful small species are actually really endangered in the wild. So for, from a zoo perspective and a visitor perspective, you can target those species while still meeting your conservation needs as well. Any more questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I know that the Vancouver Aquarium has some um, poison dart frogs and, and uh, other species. Is, I think that you mentioned one species that is involved in the um, program that you're talking about. Are, are there other species here or at the uh, Vancouver Zoo? Yeah, so here at the Vancouver Aquarium, there's two species that are part of an active captive breeding and reintroduction program. So that's the Oregon spotted frog and the northern leopard frog. So those are the two local species. They also manage a lot of other species um, for population management, but not for reintroduction. I'm just wondering if any of your research took you outside of Vancouver. Um, good question. So I did a lot of conference traveling. Uh, so I've been to conferences 
um, in, you know, St. John's to Vancouver to Ontario. Um, but specifically to get that zoo expertise, I started attending Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums meetings. And I didn't have a lot of background on husbandry or animal management. So that's when I'd really asked the animal managers there and specifically the curator for amphibians and reptiles at the Toronto Zoo was a really good mentor for me. And he provided a lot of the that expertise from the animal, animal management perspective. I also was in contact um, with um, staff members at the Zoological Society of London, and I traveled there last summer uh, to present there um, because they provided a lot of invaluable feedback for me when it came to that perspective as well. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if any of your um, findings have been published, but have you been going to more conferences and sort of like educating more um, zoo managers and curators about your findings and hope that they sort of use that data to conserve more species than they already are? Absolutely. So uh, on top of going to those academic conferences, I try to make it to as much um, zoo-focused um, conferences as well. So that would be the meeting for Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums. I went to that two years as well as that meeting in um, Canterbury in England, which was focused on amphibian conservation research specifically. So I was able to present there and at the Zoological Society of London. I've also Skyped with a lot of animal managers at different zoos and actually to get a lot of the data and some of the data that I didn't show in this talk, but for another analysis I did, I had to contact a lot of zoos individually. So if I did establish that relationship with them, then I shared my findings with them afterwards. And this work has also been published in a peer reviewed journal. <laughs> um, I was just wondering about um, re-releasing species into the wild. Some of them you were saying um, might not um, might not do very well with being reintroduced, but might do well in the zoo breeding program. Is there a way that you can make them do well? I guess like uh, are there um, like when Dr. Holina gave the antibiotic to the to the, to the orca, can you do that for the amphibians before they go back into the wild? Now, there are ways that you can increase your chances of reintroduction success. And the best way would be to address the primary threat in the wild. And that should be done in tandem with the captive breeding efforts. So if the, if the threat in the wild is invasive species, then you should be working to um, to target that invasive species before reintroducing those individuals. So it's definitely important to be working together with field conservation practitioners and collaborating between the captive conservation efforts and the field conservation efforts. Uh, there are also some other ways uh, you could look at it. For instance, when it comes to disease, a lot of people are trying to breed resistance for chytridiomycosis in a captive population and then they could re-release those individuals and they would be resistant to the disease. So there are other techniques that are currently being investigated as well. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm just curious, like through your research and things, have you, has there ever been like uh, any pushback from people in terms of like this human intervention aspect of like reintroducing species and things like that? And why? It depends on what your conservation goal is. So a lot of people don't agree that the main reason that zoos should hold species is for captive breeding and reintroduction. So some people think that the main goal should be education. Uh, so I've, I've gotten that a lot. Um, I've also gotten that field conservation is really important and they have to work together and a lot of times they don't. Uh, so that's a big limitation to captive conservation efforts as well. Uh, there's also, I guess there are, there's a lot of expertise in um, private like hobbyists. So people that just breed frogs as a hobby and they have a lot of technical technical expertise and husbandry expertise, but they don't always talk to zoo managers um, because there's that little, like they don't 
they don't always yeah, talk to each other. Uh, so there's been a little bit of conflict there as well at trying to determine why some species aren't bringing captivity and trying to get that knowledge from private breeders but facing some resistance. Any more questions? Um, I have another one. Um, just very, you know, like very short sentences. What would your recommendation be for zoos and aquariums to optimize their conservation efforts for um, amphibians? I would recommend that zoos and aquariums have very specific conservation goals in mind. So if that's education, then select your species based on that and select perhaps local species. If you're, or similarly, if your goal as a zoo is captive breeding and reintroduction, then you should be selecting local species that you can actually reintroduce and be working with those field conservation biologists to address um, the threats in the wild. So just being very clear about what your target is and selecting your species based on those targets. Thank you. Uh, any last questions? With species that they're reintroducing, what kind of time frame and how will they know when they've reintroduced enough? So in terms of the time frame, you actually want to do it pretty quickly because you don't want to have species in captivity for too long. So usually after one or two generations, you want to be re-releasing them because you don't want them to adapt to captive conditions. And then in terms of knowing of whether it's working, they basically go out and they do uh, population assessments. So they could do like a capture and release. So um, they can mark individuals using a pit tag. And then when they capture them again, then they can do those analyses to, to predict what the population numbers are. And they go off of those. One more question, anybody? Uh, okay. In which case, I'd like to thank Alana for her fascinating and extremely informative talk. Um, and thank you all for coming. And as a quick reminder, yeah, if you have a loony or so in your pocket and you would like to donate to keep these programs running, that would be a fantastic donation box. It's just that aside. So thank you very much, and thank you, Alana. Thank you. Ruth is highly, look at, this is how you turn these ones on and off.